morbid color collage here. We hear the voice telling us from beyond the grave, thank you for leaving me a message. Gal complies, and in so doing, she buries Anna for good. I quote, I, she said that in the film, I remember that day when you, she said that in the message, I remember that day when you bathed in my bath water, bath water in Kyoto. You told me that it was the most erotic experience you ever had with a woman. I always wondered if it was true. Proxy is, and of course, is an efficient weapon against the slightest threat of melancholy. The next section is called the tact. It is at the very end of Fibrille that the French writer Michel Léris exposed what he means by the, his rule of the game, his règle du jeu. This is a phrase that is a title under which we group the four volumes of this autobiography, of which Fibri is the third. It says, a list of forbidden moves, the pronouncement of certain refusal, it constitutes a moral code which made it possible for him to write, he says. A professional code of conduct, an ethics of speech, which is the foundation of an arts poetica as well as of a way of being. Lewis delivers his decalogue not to lie, not to make any promise one is not sure to be able to fulfill, etc. And then he painstakingly annotates it. Not to lie, thus the way with all the tricks destined to fool the reader whom, if he or she must be seduced, must not be so by tactics used just for show, etc. Immediately after this, however, which takes a few pages, like a good casuist, he provides us with a southern reason why it is impossible to obey these prescriptions, giving us countless examples of justifiable exceptions. Not to lie, yet, unless by chance remaining silent is enough, one has to lie if only evil is to be expected from the admission of truth, plunge into a despair, terminally terminal, terminal ill man would rather remain oblivious to his fate, arm an estimable person who is having trouble, etc. Not to make a promise one can't keep, a good excuse for refusing any commitment. Isn't it better to expose oneself to the risk of not being able to keep a promise than to be so cautious that one would never have to chicken out etc. Carl always honors the vows, always respects the rule of her game. No matter how absurd is her list of forbidden moves, the contract which for each work she established with her character <coughs> is of the same nature that the one with which her mother, or Emmanuel Perrotin, 20 years later, signed with a private eye so that he tells Carl the whole day. She traces for herself a line of conduct that she follows to the dot, no matter how dangerous it might be. At the risk of being caught in the act, she rummages through the belongings of the clients of the hotel where she temporarily, temporarily works as a chambermaid. At the risk of being attacked, or even worse, she asks perfect strangers to bring her to a preferred spot, often very isolated, in the most dangerous borough of New York, the Bronx. And the place where she, she was born were not exactly light, full of light. At the risk of losing the man she loves during the three months' absence that such a treat implies, and the man in question that forewarned her of this possibility, she leaves for Japan. These packs with herself are a constant of her work, a persistence, perhaps, of the kind of the autobiographic contact, contract inaugurated by Rousseau, I swear to tell all the truth. Then one had to wait until Anna's character uh, is reincarnated into that of Maria for Cal to recognize such packs as a recurrent theme, or at least for her to officially say so. It is only after the 1992 publication of Paul Oster's novel, Leviathan, that Cal, following Leris' example, confiding in us the rule of the game, legis legislating all her past work, and all republished in five little books, as well as two new books, makes a set of seven books. The difference with Leris is paramount, for this rule is being dictated a posteriori by Oster, or rather by his own interpretation of her game. Each of the seven books published in the set in 1998 under the title Double Games begins, double jeu in French, begins before the title page but after the dedication with a full exposition of the rule on a double spread. There were three moves in his, this Oster Cal game, and I'm listing them by chronological order. In order to create the character of Maria, Oster borrowed certain actions performed by Cal for a work following a descriptive text almost word for word. He also credited Maria with some rituals imitating, or so he thought, those invented by Carl in her work. Finally, in 1994, past Maria and his novel, Oster sent Carl personal instructions on how to improve her life in New York because she asked. That was, that's the title of the instructions. The first move 
consisted in showing how Sophie's life influenced the life of Maria. That's uh, the way it's phrased in the rules again. The evidence being Carl's piece that were integrated in Leviathan, in Oster's novel. For the second move, it is a matter of showing how the life of Maria influenced the life of Sophie in realizing works based upon the rituals imagined by Oster. For the third move, Carl simply followed Oster's instructions as faithfully as possible. And although the, the directions came from Oster from both the second and the third move, there's a slight difference between the two cases. So, she publishes the, 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 the Oster makes, makes this novel where she becomes uh, part of her work, uh, become the, the work of a character called Maria. He didn't, he also didn't know Sophie Kahl at all. He didn't think that she would catch it, actually. He was probably even naive sometimes. Um, then uh, he also attributes two new pieces to this Maria that he invented himself, and Kahl realizes them. And then they get into contact, and she asks him to send real instructions for real pieces, but which are she probably prompted him to make them a little com more complicated. I don't, I don't see. So, the first book of Double Jeu, De l'Obéissance, on, on Obedience, exclusively devoted to the second move, that is to the apocryphal, wor apocryphal work, is the only one of the seven volume set where the pages concerning Maria in Oster's Leviathan are reproduced in facsimile again. This was all the more easy since Cal and Oster had the same publisher in France. Very elegant typography, format, nice paper. The passages referring to specific works are outlined in red, and the parts when Maria strayed from a model are crossed out in red as well, no matter how tiny the gap is. So, for instance, in the phrase, since the age of 14, 14 is crossed out and replaced by the number 27, refers to it for the, the birthday ceremony. In the phrase, for several days is meant two pictures of her, several is crossed out and replaced by one. And the S of days is crossed out as well. That's for the shadow. That she goes through all the, old, the old chapter of Oster's book that deals with the character of Maria. Furthermore, each of these outlined passages is stamped in pink with the number of the book in the set in which the work it describes is published. The stamp book, book one, refers to those works by Maria that were invented by Oster, the apoc apocryphal works. The, and there is no stamp uh, book book seven in this compendium, given that the last volume of the double jeu set is one that records Carl's following of Oster's instruction. So there couldn't be Leviathan, of course. Dutifully published at the beginning of that very book. It's a third rule. Signed by both Sophie Carl and Paul Oster, this seventh volume is entitled Gotham Handbook. I won't describe it in any length, I'll just speak about it a little later. Even more, more explicitly than with the partial rerun of Anatoly within exquisite pain, the reader is invited to revisit the past of the artist. We are informed that this past has been recently reorganized. We are given a map, the excerpts from Leviathan, and a marked, a marked out itinerary. Book two for the paragraphs describing the birthday ceremony, book four for the shadow. We are similarly told to consult book three for the wardrobe and the striptease, two autobiographical stories. Book four, again, for Suite Venitienne, book five for the hotel, book six for the address book, a very slim book, just a few pages, as I told you before. Each passage that has been outlined and stamped in the facsimile of Leviathan, included in book one, reappears in the volume indicated by the stamp before Carl's publication of the specific work he refers to. Oddly though, crossing out and corrections have disappeared from the second text. And I'm just wondering, is it to suggest that it is now the reader's turn to become a corrector? Is this an invitation to imitation as a way of life? as a mode of absence. I don't know. Carl distances herself, she becomes absent through Oster's Maria, this alter ego whom she did not generate herself. She applies herself to match two identities, once again, the character of the novel and the artist's personality, suggesting, that's a constant theme, by that, that the latter, the artist's personality, is as fictitious as the former. Such is the effect of proxy. Yet there is something that does not quite fit. The works that Oster imagined for Maria are much too simple to realize, innocuous. Their scenery are not credible because they simply they imply neither danger nor uneasiness. Oster, in short, is a poor forger. 